this journey that starts with him. If you got a burden, come lay it on down. Raise up your Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Swannanoa Valley. I'm Rose Levering and I'm on the Board of Trustees. Unitarian Universalists have different religious beliefs, but share a common faith. We know that there's something sacred about life and we're committed to finding it together, even if it takes our whole lives. This is the first week, <clears throat> the first weekend in March and it feels like spring has sprung in the mountains. It feels like a long winter is behind us. And it feels like for the country that this is a time of renewed hope and maybe cautious optimism. We invite you to join us after the service for the Zoom coffee hour. There being no announcements, with that, let the service begin. Good morning, friends. I'm Lee Redding. I'm a member of the Sunday Service Associates, and I am the host for this morning's service. Our guest speaker is Eric Bannon from the Raleigh area. Some of you may remember Eric. He's actually performed his service and song for us a couple of times live here in our sanctuary. Eric is a husband. He's a father. He's a singer. 
songwriter, storyteller. He hosts a live streaming radio program called the Bynum Front Porch. He is a veteran, served in the Coast Guard on a rescue flight crew. He is a backcountry racer, adventure racer. He is a cancer survivor and he has a master's in computer science. Quite a well-rounded individual. Eric, like many artists, has had to adapt in this COVID era, and instead of performing live, he has recorded his stories and his songs in his living room studio. We're delighted to have Eric with us this morning, and with that speaker intro, I'll light our chalice, and may our service begin. so much for tuning in. Maestro Glenn on the piano. We're going to do a, a traditional hymn, Wade in the Water, with lyrics I learned from folk singer, storyteller Reggie Harris. <laughs> Now is the time in the service when we invite you to connect with our community by sharing your joys, your sorrows, and your concerns. We thank you for 
in advance for sharing with us. This week I had no email joys or concerns, but I would like to register one joy. Carolyn Shorkey has been taking over the bulk of the editing and compiling of all of the services that you get to watch every Sunday, and I am very joyful for that. I truly appreciate how much work she's put into the services and learning how to video edit and add all the fun stuff that we get to see every week and also see her creativity. So a big, big, big thank you to Carolyn. And I know that Milt is very supportive of Carolyn. So thank you to Milt too. And also I've gotten to partake in many treats that Milt has provided over the past few months. So thanks for that as well. I'd like to share with you a story. It's actually a poem by Reverend Peter Rabel called Foundations of Community. We build on foundations we did not lay. We warm ourselves by fires we did not light. We sit in the shade of trees we did not plant. We drink from wells we did not dig. We profit from persons we did not know. This is as it should be. Together we are more than any one person could be. Together we can build across the generations. Together we can renew our hope and faith in the life that is yet to unfold. Together we can heed the call to a ministry of care and justice. We are ever bound in community. May it always be so. And so it is with deep gratitude that we ask all of our members and friends to support the work and the outreach of our congregation. Life's bringing I'm going 
Good morning. My name is Eric Bannon. Today's message is reclaiming the sacred in our day-to-day -day lives. Everybody I know has some sort of ritual in their lives. Maybe it's that first cup of coffee in the morning. Maybe it's the walk around the neighborhood with the dog. Or maybe it's reading the paper with a cat in your lap. Maybe it's a quiet prayer as we greet the day or saying the rosary. Maybe you're not a morning person. Maybe watching the sunset or some quiet meditation at the end of the day is your thing. Some of our more sacred rituals, like the ones we do on holidays, are passed down from our parents and or grandparents and even beyond for generations. Many of us grew up with rituals that were linked to ancient stories and traditions faded with time. Now, I think back to the rituals I grew up with. My parents were devout Catholics, and my upbringing was full of practices I never really understood. One example was that my parents never ate meat on Fridays. Now, the good thing about this ritual was on Fridays, my mother made my grandmother, her mother's, tuna fish tomato spaghetti sauce with angel hair pasta. Oh, this dish was also prepared on Christmas Eve. Now this tradition of no meat Friday has long since faded into distant memory, but my wife has learned how to make the sauce and makes it on special occasions. And it's still one of my favorite comfort foods. And my son loves it too. I looked up ritual in the online dictionary and there were a number of definitions and a lot of them sounded like this. A ritual is a sequence of activities involving gestures, words, actions, or objects performed in a sequestered place and according to a set sequence. Rituals may be prescribed by the traditions of a community, including a religious community. Now, when I get ready to write a new sermon, I always check in with, uh, for some guidance with my teaching mentor, my preaching mentor, Reverend Tom Below. Now, Reverend Tom introduced me to this wonderful book right here, Faithful Practices, Everyday Ways to Feed Your Spirit. This is available in the UU Bookstore. Um, Eric Walker Wickstrom is the editor. Now, as I read the introduction to this book, I realize that many of these rituals in our lives are in fact spiritual practices. Now, what do I mean when I say spiritual practice? In the introduction, they quote Unitarian Henry David Thoreau from his classic book, Walden. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and to see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not when I came to die, discovered that I had not lived. I do not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation, unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck all the marrow out of life. And not when I came to die, discovered that I had not lived. To live in a way that is truly alive, a quest, if you will. The book goes on to mention that a spiritual quest is in many ways like an artistic quest. Hmm. Say you decided you wanted to learn how to play guitar. Now, if you picked it up every now and again, you might luck out into creating something interesting. But if you want to make progress, you've got to practice often, daily if possible. It takes discipline. Pablo Casals is often regarded as the greatest cellist in history. Now, early in my musical life, one of my teachers told me that he practiced scales every day, even into his 90s. He even practiced on the day he died. 
When asked, I think this is before he died, when asked why in his 90s, having mastered the instrument, he still practiced something rudimentary as scales, he remarked, I'm starting to make progress. Now, the pandemic has changed our lives in so many ways. For many months now, we've been grieving, grieving the loss of so many of our daily routines and rituals and practices that gave our lives meaning and structure. Many of us are experiencing a great sense of loss because of all the rituals and sacred practices in our lives which have been disallowed. The spiritual practice of our Sunday in-person worship is one of the threads that holds many of our lives together. Now, back when I was, back when we could meet in person to church, my, my entire Sunday morning was sacred. I would awaken and rise while my wife and son were still asleep. I would savor a quiet cup of tea on my porch, listening to the woods around my house come to life, listen to the birds, and later in the morning, all the actions of getting ready to go to church, getting cleaned up, picking out a shirt and a hat, the 25 or so minute drive in, listening to TED Talks, even the walk from the parking lot. Being embraced by our sacred communities, I enter the building and the beginning the hunt for our name badges, all in the hugs. And then there's the music, singing together. Oh, oh, raising our voices in unison and in harmony. The sermons, the joys and sorrows. Shalom. And the thing I miss the most, coffee hour. So what do we do? How do we reclaim the sacred? How do we invent, reclaim, and explore the sacred in our daily lives in the absence of, of, of in-person worship? Now, I believe the fourth principle of Unitarian Universalism, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, gives us permission to do just this, just that. We decide what is holy. We decide what is sacred. Now, sometimes we might need a little nudge. Now, for me, this came with a great heart-to-heart -heart conversation with my dear friend Donna Washington, an international um, touring storyteller. She was relating a conversation in which someone challenged her celebration of Kwanzaa, claiming it was a made-up holiday. And her response was something like this, newsflash, all the holidays are made up. You think they grow on trees. Now I carried this little nugget of wisdom around me for a while and I grinned every time I thought of it. I still do. Now, back in 2020, after my son graded, graduated eighth grade in June, we did a little bit of traveling to celebrate. And when we got home and I looked at my calendar for July and the first half of August, I saw nothing. No summer camps for my son. I mean, I usually spend July and August at Susie and the Swannanoa Gathering and playing shows on the road. And there was nothing. Nada. And this scared me. Sure, there's plenty of stuff online, but, but we need something more. So what was I going to do? Well, on the morning of the 4th of July, I decided to declare July Holy Month. Well, why not? <laughs> What's more sacred than this moment right here, right now? I started thinking, okay, how do I celebrate this new Holy Month? I need a new daily ritual. I need a spiritual practice. So I decided that I would arise at 5 a.m. every day I would have a quiet cup of tea, I would lace up my shoes and walk up my driveway into our cul-de-sac to greet the dawn. I live in rural Chatham County and my, my driveway's a pretty good walk. Now, in my house, summer means sleeping in, especially for my teenage son. So I started getting up at five again. And, mm, 
So I, I'd gotten out of the habit of waking up early. So at first I struggled with the old 500, wake up. But after a week or so, my eyes would open automatically at five. Oh yeah. As I got into the second week of my new holy month, the ritual, this ritual of getting up early became the highlight of my day. That first cup of green tea in the morning became part of my ritual as well. I would set out a clean, clean mug, an infuser, a teaspoon on a colorfully, colorful, precisely folded dish towel so it would be ready for my use. As the month went on, I would start looking forward to bedtime in anticipation of awakening the next day to greet the dawn. I would prepare my tea set before I went to bed. This became part of the ritual. I would clean and declutter the kitchen so it would be welcoming to me in the pre-dawn hours. Yes, yes, yes. Cleaning your kitchen can be a spiritual practice. It's all about your intent. Now, sunrise is around 6 a.m. in July here. So at about five minutes till, I would walk up my driveway and stand in the cul-de-sac and look at the morning light streaming through the trees. I mean... How many of us set aside time for ourselves, for yourselves every day? How, let me try that again. How many of you set aside time for yourselves every day? How about every week? How many of you take a Sabbath? Speaking of Sabbath, rest is one of my favorite spiritual practices. Now, one of the things I miss about my nine to five IT job was the structure it gave my life. I knew that every weekday at 11.30, I was going to lunch. Lunch was important. Unless the place was literally on fire, I was out the door with a book under my arm heading for one of my favorite local restaurants. Was this a ritual? Hmm, maybe. Was it a spiritual practice? Hmm. Maybe. It gave my life structure. It gave me some time to myself away from staring at a computer screen in a beige cubicle. How many of you intentionally make time for yourselves every day, even a few minutes? I recall a sermon by Reverend Lisa Garcia Sampson entitled The Courage to Rest. She talks about how our first principle of, of, of affirming the inherent worth and dignity of all beings is often simplified to be viewed as the way in which we treat others. It's used as the basis for our social justice programs. And she goes on to say, and I'm quoting here, before being about anyone else, that the first principle is about us. It is the place from which our faith unfolds. Not because we are more important than others, but the way we live in this world, the way we love in this world, begins with the way we love ourselves. The way we live in this world, the way we love in this world, begins with the way we love ourselves. As Unitarian Universalists, we decide what is holy. We decide what is sacred. We can make our own rituals, even our own holidays. So how will you reclaim the sacred? Your life may already be filled with the spiritual practices. Some you may recognize, some you may not. So I encourage you today and every day this week to take some time to yourself and see the sacred in your daily life. Amen. And may this be so.
light that shines, showing us the way. We are the keepers of the flame, pushing back the darkness in our world today. Yes, in our world today. 